after we get all that weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, uh, and what are we supposed to do with this furious day of the Lord where the Lord is coming in wrath, right? Um, that permeates all of our texts. It permeated the Zephaniah text. It's in the Psalm where it talks about a God of wrath. Uh, the Thessalonians talked about the day of the Lord is coming. And then we have this awful parable of Jesus. Um, what are we going to do with any of that? Um, Especially because I've been, so, you know, I've been saying over and over again that the Old Testament God isn't a God of wrath, that the Old Testament God is uh, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you find that over and over and over again in the Old Testament, that God is gracious, merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And I've been trying to say that's, that's the God of the Old Testament, not this other one. And yet here that other one shows up. Um, on today. And it is true, except when you get to the prophets. And when you get to the prophets, that's where you actually do get this God of wrath that everybody thinks is uh, everybody's worst nightmare of God. Um, let's locate ourselves uh, temporally in time. Um, we exist here in this space in an alternate time universe. Um, it's called liturgical time. Um, it's the nature of being an Episcopalian, that we live in this alternate calendar where the beginning of the church year starts at Advent. So the beginning of our year starts at Advent and it moves towards Christmas and we tell the life and story of Jesus and we move towards Easter and then we get to Pentecost and then we have this long period that they call Pentecost. Back in my childhood, they called it ordinary time. And we come, we're coming towards the end of the church year. So where we are located in time is the end of the church year, which is actually next Sunday, which will be culminating next Sunday in the reign of Christ. And so you get all the texts start talking about the end of things, the end of time. Last Sunday I talked about the second coming, right, in this notion of a second coming of Christ. Today we have the day of the Lord, judgment day. Um, you know, we can look forward to what happens next week. Um, <laughs> when it all culminates in a big bang. Um, we're also in the book of Matthew. We've been reading Matthew this whole year. And in the book of Matthew, we're in this section in Matthew 24 and 25 where it is about the end of things, right? It's, it's, it's eschatological. That's a phrase theologians use, eschatological. So we're, in, we're, we're both in the church year and in the calendar. We're at the end. We're at the culmination, which is why we get all these ta texts talking about Judgment Day. That's why it's happening now. Um, and uh, it would be easy to go ahead and, I think, dismiss these t this text, dismiss the wrath of God, right? It's so much easier to say, well, I don't like that God. That's not the God I believe in. Um, unfortunately, we're with a tradition that wrestles with these things. We keep reading these things over and over again, and we wrestle with them, and so we've got them. And I think it may be worth wrestling with um, as much as we dislike it. Um, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs. So I will punish the people who rest complacently on their drugs. Right, these are people who've been drinking wine. It's the dregs of wine. And now they're resting complacently, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will God do, nor will the Lord do harm, right? So it's, it's the, the, pro, the prophet is speaking to people who become complacent, who doubt in any way that God has anything to do with any of it. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid to waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. It's because they have sinned against the Lord who is gracious and merciful. 
And so what that means is they have not been gracious and they have not been merciful. They've been sitting in their houses, comfortable and complacent, and they've not shown mercy, and they've not shown gra grace. So their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Like, we're reading this text in a context of affluence, right? We're affluent people. And here the prophet is speaking to affluent people. I mean, the prophets never speak like this to the humble. The prophets never speak like this to the poor. The prophets never speak like this. The wrath of God is never meant for the people, the merciful and the gracious. The wrath of God is always towards the rich, towards the proud, towards the complacent. And here we are, <laughs> um, fitting the profile. And so is this a message for us in some sense? Where are we in terms of our own complacency? Where are we in terms of our own pride? What do we trust in? Right? Are we trusting in our own wealth? I mean, this, this passage is saying, look, your wealth will be taken from you, and then what will you have? What will you trust in? Right? And that will seem like a day of wrath and a day of destruction and a day of devastation. Right? The fear, the, there's a fear that's kind of being elicited, but it really is a question of what do you trust in? What are you hoping? What are you hoping for? That's what the prophet is saying. I mean, it gets better in Zephaniah. The, the Zephaniah this is how Zephaniah starts. <laughs> and then Zephaniah ends with the humble and um, the, with the humble, you know, and, and the merciful actually living in the joy of the Lord. That's where it ends. But this is a message for those who actually, whose ears can't hear anymore and whose eyes can't see and whose hearts are hardened. That's what this message is about. It's to open eyes, to open ears, to help open up hearts in some way. So that's why we read it. We read it saying, okay, hey, what can we learn from this? What might it say to us? How can it help us be more merciful and gracious and be more like the people of God in this world? And not live in our own complacency. The gospel text, I want to segue then to the gospel text where, you know, it ends with this weeping and gnashing of teeth and I think it's also about fear. It's also about our connection to the divine. I, what are you going to trust in? Are you going to trust in your wealth? Or are you going to trust in the character of the divine? And ironically, this passage is, and seems to be about wealth. It's this weird economic system where there are masters and slaves. Um, you have a master who's actually loaning his wealth to his servants and allowing them to use his wealth to generate more wealth, right? Um, and to those who have much is given and to, to those who don't have much will be taken away. And it ends with the poorer of the bunch in the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think what's troubling is the way that this passage gets read as if this is really what the kingdom of heaven is like. But we miss, I think, the hyperbole that's going on here. Jesus is talking about talents. There's five talents and there's two talents and there's one talent, which doesn't seem like a lot. Um, but in the ancient world, a talent was the largest measure of wealth. It was the largest um, denomination that you could use. Um, the typical standard denomination was the denarius. So there was a coin, a denarius. And if you worked hard, it represented a day of your labor, a day of your life. So if you worked for somebody for a day, they would give you a denarius in exchange for your life your life energy, your life force that you had given by working on that day, you receive a denarius in return. 
So denarius is one day of your life. That's what it represents. A talent is worth 6,000 denarius, or denarii, right? So 6,000 days of your life, that's how much a talent is worth. That's about, if you get two days off a week, that's 20 years. One talent is 20 years of your life. So if you have five talents, that's 100 years of your life. And so in this story, and Jesus' hearers are hearing that, they're hearing, oh, that's an amazing number. One person is, the master is giving one person 100 years, what represents 100 years of life and how it's lived. And this person takes that 100 years of life and living and uses it to replicate more who lives into this sense of abundance and, 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 you know, uses it to do good and spread just more life, <laughs> more abundance. That's what's happening. And then you've got some, and, and, you know, when the person comes back at the end and says, look, I've, I've, I've doubled it, the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. Enter into the joy because that's what it's about. It's about joy. You got the person with two talents, which represents 40 years of living, 40 years of life, 40 years of energy spent in creativity and, you know, imagination and construction. That's four, that's two talents right there, 40 years. And this person takes their 40 years of, 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 of energy and life and does it and again, creates more good, more creativity, more beauty in the world. And comes back to the master and says, look, I've doubled it. And the master's like, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And then you have the last person who only has one talent, which is 20 years of living, 20 years of life energy one talent. And the, what's curious and what's different here is not so much the amount that's given as it is this person's relationship to the master, this person's conception of the master, this person lives in fear. And fear is always a spiritual condition. Fear is a profound spiritual condition. When people live in fear, they, they withdraw into themselves, they get defensive, they, they have a sense of scarcity. When people live in fear, it's often hard to have an open heart or an open mind. Like it's a profoundly crippling, disabling place to live from. That's why safety is so important. This man is afraid. He's afraid of the character of the master because he, he thinks that the master is um, a harsh man, reaping where he does not sow, gathering where he does not scatter seed. I was afraid and I went and I hid that talent. I went and I hid that 20 years. And it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy when this man is living in fear, thinking that the master is harsh, thinking that the master is punitive and retri retributive, it squashes and quelches what that person can do. And so at the end when the master comes, he's got nothing to show. And then his sense of fear becomes a self-fulfilling thing where he ends up in this place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, the, one, the ones who didn't live in fear ended up in joy. The one who lived in fear ended up in the place of the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I think the point is, I mean, the, to not, it's about the nature of how you understand the master. Like, is the divine retributive and punitive? Is the divine something we should fear, like on the day of the Lord, where there will be destruction? Or actually, is the divine merciful and gracious? slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I mean, there's a choice there. And the choice we take 
will determine how we live. Amen.